Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me, please, to um, Matthew 28. We don't want to baptize the music stand. Today we are graced and blessed to have a baptism. And this is one of the two celebrations directly ordered by the Lord of the Church that we are to participate in. Baptism and the Lord's table are what we call the ordinances of the church. And they are the only authorized, biblically authorized symbols of the new covenant community. Baptism represents our union in Christ and the church. And the Lord's table represents our fellowship with Christ and with his people. And the ordinance of baptism is clearly developed and described in the New Testament. Now, according to the book of Hebrews, it has some roots in the Old Testament washings and so on, but really emerges as being a New Covenant distinctive. It is a part of the kingdom of God. John the Baptist comes and he is preaching the call to repent and to come to the kingdom And to enter the kingdom of God, because it is near, it is at hand, he is also baptizing. Not something unknown in the Old Testament, but certainly infused with new meaning. And so this morning I want to just take some time to think about and help us to be sure that our understanding of baptism is as biblically informed as it can be. First, we begin with the requirement to baptize, the New Testament by precept, and it's funny how that was a good idea on my screen, oh well, Um, just follow along. The New Testament by precepts makes baptism necessary for the church to do. This means for the local gathered body to do, and for all who believe to do. Now we get the precept first from Jesus in Matthew 28, which is where I've had you turn. We're going to be in a lot of different scriptures this morning. Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, Jesus' command to the apostles and through them to us, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now how are we going to make disciples? We have two ING verbs baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son to the Holy Spirit, that's first. And teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So our imperative, our command is to the church, is to make disciples. That's what we are to do from top to bottom, from beginning to end. That is what we are to do. That's what this is about. When I'm preaching, I am thinking about publicly with you making disciples. And more and more at the chapel, we are thinking about that deeper and wider and church wide. What does it mean to be commissional? To be a people who are consciously, intentionally, in nearly everything we do, we are making disciples. And how are we to do that? What are the means to that? Well, step one is we are baptizing as the Lord ordained. We are to go through the public ordinance of baptism as the entry gate, as the beginning of making a disciple. Now, the imperative here is to the church. It is our responsibility as leaders, as a church, to make sure that this is done. We are to baptize those who intend to be disciples. The second way the disciples are made are by teaching them everything that Jesus, and by implication, the New Covenant, the New Testament, commands. And so part of disciple-making is working through the commands of the New Testament and teaching you how to obey what the Lord has commanded, and particularly what the Lord has commanded through the apostolic deposit of the New Testament. So, we have a responsibility as a church 
to make disciples. And to obey that command, we are to baptize those who believe, and we are to teach those who believe. The Lord has told us then that He is with us all the way to the end of the age. So from the beginning of the command up until Jesus returns, when this age ends, the Lord is present among discipling people. That's the point, right? Go make disciples, and lo, I am with you. With all of you? Any of you? Does it matter what you're doing? No. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Now let's then think, since we have that prophetic, that precept from the Lord, Look at Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. You can follow along. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 8. I've called this the prophetic baptism by John. In just a moment, you'll see why it's prophetic. John appeared baptizing, verse 4, Mark 1. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him, were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John is the last prophet of the Old Testament and really the first of the New. Baptizes Jews who want to repent of their sins and to identify with the believing, repentant people of God. So he's coming preaching the kingdom and he's coming preaching in a way that says if you want to step away from the unbelieving people of Israel and be identified with the believing, repentant people of God who are Jews and want to follow the Lord and want to obey Him, then, and this was, this was new, this was shocking, And yet God had moved in people's hearts throughout all of Judea and Jerusalem, uh, those that they were going out to him. And so by taking the baptism of John, the people were acknowledging that they were repenting of their sins. And Jesus will also bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the physical thing that they do will represent a greater reality that will come later. And so that will unfold a number of years later at Pentecost. Baptism of the Holy Spirit that was poured out at Pentecost on God's people. And we are downstream from that outpouring, if you will. Another topic for another day. But what about the pattern of Jesus? Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? Jesus answered, said, answered him, let it be so now. For it is fitting, it's appropriate for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So, Jesus obeyed and uh, went through the water of baptism to publicly identify himself with the repentant people of God. And consequently, the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and Jesus was the first to be baptized in or with the Spirit in that sense. And he receives the Father's approval. Now, Jesus is not baptized because he needs to repent of sin. He has no sin. 
And that's John's objection at some point. I'm a sinner. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus says, I understand that. However, in order to fulfill all that righteousness requires of people who will follow us, it's the implication, then you baptize me and it will set this pattern for all of us. And so as, after Jesus is baptized, the Spirit comes upon him so that he will be empowered for his ministry. And from this moment on, Jesus will live the life we do with the indwelling work of the Spirit, doing all he does in us, in Jesus too. And Jesus' step of righteousness is affirmed by his Father. Jesus wasn't doing this on his own. It wasn't on his own initiative. He was following the will and purpose of his Father. And when he comes up out of the water, the Father's voice descends from heaven as the dove descends upon him as the Spirit. And the Father approves of him. This is my Son, the one I love. And so the Lord, the Father was well pleased with him. Now, if we had all this and never saw it in the book of Acts, then we would have to pause and we would have to ask, if we see all this in the Gospels, why don't we see it in the book of Acts? But we do. And so we have the practice of the church in the New Testament. We see the apostles in the church obeying the Lord and baptizing those who believe and bow. Considered Acts 3, verses 36 through 41. Acts 3, verses 36 to 41. Let all, this is Peter preaching, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter sent, said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, everyone whom uh, the Lord our God summons, calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So, those who had received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. <laughs> what a day. What a day. Then look at Acts 8, verses 34 to 40. So this is the story of Philip, the un Philip being um, spiritually transported out to meet an Ethiopian eunuch who had worked in the, the court of Queen Candace of Ethiopia. And he is on his way home from Jerusalem after the Passover celebrations and so on. So he seems to be a Jewish proselyte. <clears throat> and he's on his way home. And the Lord, he's reading Isaiah. And... Um, as he's reading Isaiah, he's coming across text and he doesn't understand who's being referred to in the text, particularly in Isaiah 53. And Philip joins himself in the chariot and asks him, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, no, who is this talking about? Is this talking about the author? He's talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? So we pick up in verse 34, and the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or about someone else? Now, and then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Well, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. Pause, this is not in our Bibles, but it seems like the early Coptic church in Egypt and northern Africa was a result of this eunuch going home 
and preaching the gospel. Now the Coptic church has lost its doctrinal moorings. But it's amazing to think about the gospel spreading all across North Africa and even down into Central Africa in the first century um, of the church. But Philip, uh, but Philip found himself as a Zotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Now, there are many other examples of the apostle and the elders obeying the, the Great Commission. And one of the things you note that in Jesus' baptism and, and in this one in particular, where we're seeing an individual, they go down into water and they come up out of water. And so the, the expectation of these texts is immersion. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. First of all, I want you to notice that they baptized those who believed. That was a pre-requirement. They tended to do so as soon and as quickly as possible. With the eunuch, he's on his way, he's going his way to where there is no church. And he recognizes that he wants to publicly profess faith. Even if he has his entourage, certainly the man who's the treasurer of the queen has an entourage with him and he wants to publicly witness to his faith. They baptized as an act of obedience and as a means whereby a person could identify themselves as being saved. He's not asking to be baptized. No one is saying you need to be baptized in order to be saved. But if you are going to say you are saved, that you have believed, that you have bowed, this is the first step of discipleship, of following the Lord, of becoming a committed follower of Jesus. And those who were baptized were identified with the believers. And so baptism was the only biblically authorized means by which a person could publicly profess faith in Christ. The church down through the years has created other substitutes. And they are additions. And they are unauthorized by the New Testament. If you want to say, I believe in Jesus, then you ask for baptism at the next opportunity. That's what you do. That's how you say publicly to the body of believers and to the world that I have believed and bowed to Christ. Our problem now is we live in a world in which baptism is just a religious rite that lets you join a religious club. And it's lost its meaning and significance. Here, it doesn't cost you anything except maybe getting a little wet and maybe this morning it being, it, it's 80 degrees, 86 degrees, but it's going to feel a little cold. That, that's all it's going to cost you. And maybe some public embarrassment if you're not much of a public speaker. In some parts of the world, if you do this, your family will have a funeral. You will lose your inheritance. To become a Christian in many parts of the world is okay if you say it quietly and keep it to yourself. But the minute you do this, you're done. And you will be treated as a non-person. It's costly. It means something. Go through these waters and raise your hand and say, I am a Christian and I want the world to know and I want these people to know. And those who were baptized were enumerated with the membership. It's interesting that in the Acts text that when they were baptized, as many as believed were baptized, and then they were added to the number. Added to the number of what? Right? There's some count, because they knew there were 3,000. And so we find through the New Testament, not necessarily a command for membership, but we do find that people are expected to in some way be identified not only with Christ as a believer, but with a local gathered church. All the churches in the New Testament know who their people are, who they are responsible to shepherd, and who is liable for church discipline. Now, having said all that, I want to be very clear. Baptism does not, cannot, will not, ever, under any conditions, save a person. Because it is something you do. It is something, it is, in essence, a work of obedience. It cannot, it will not save you. 
nor, frankly, is it a means for rededication. I've screwed up my life, and so I want to be baptized because in some way I'm starting over. No, it's not what it is. When Sherry is baptized this morning, she is saying to all of us, I believe, I bow, I want to follow Jesus. That's what she's saying. That's what it's for. But the Lord has already regenerated anyone who has come through this. And that's why we examine, we ask questions, we listen for testimonies as elders, and then the person here will give their own testimony of faith to you. That comes because the person has already believed. That person has already bowed. The saving work of Christ and the Spirit has already been done. And so that step of discipleship is being followed. And a true believer, having been taught about biblical baptism, will seek to be baptized. Now... Talk about the mode. How is, how is baptism in the New Testament? We confess, we believe, we hold to baptism means to immerse in water. We get that first from the language, the Greek word. I'm sorry about the Greek here. Baptizo. Okay. I, I sometimes wish, this is a sidebar, but... I sometimes wish translators would just have the guts to translate the word like deacon. simply means servant. It's diakonos. Or diakonia. And baptizo should be translated in every case where it makes sense to, to place into the act, the right, the, the, the means. And so... Go into all the world and, and make disciples of all nations, placing them into, immersing them. We could just substitute the word immersion. And so the word baptizo means to immerse or to place into. That's what it means. And from the culture, how is the word commonly used? If the word comes into Christianity and comes into our Bibles, unless it's a specially created word, and there's almost no word in the New Testament that does not have some kind of coinage in the common culture. That's why you don't find the word Trinity in the Bible. It's a theological word that did not exist in there because there's, there was nothing that was Trinity but God. And so it was usually referred to placing a garment in water to wash it or in dye to color it. Now in the 60s we had to also say comment and say, you know, tie-dye was not popular then and some of you have no idea what that is. But when you baptizoed a garment, everyone understood that you had placed it into a, a, a barrel or a bucket of dye and you had immersed it into the water and you had brought it up out of the dye so that the garment was fully dyed. It was a placing into. That would have been how anyone would have understood it. And, interestingly, the word was used sometimes, particularly in the Roman culture, to refer to being united with. And so the pagans, who had no culture or civilization or government, were baptizoed into the Roman way. Which is really interesting. And so there was a common, at least in Paul's day, this cultural understanding of being placed into a group of people. But then the most powerful reason to immerse is from the imagery. Look at Romans 6, 1 to 5. Romans 6, 1 to 5. Here we have the word baptizo. I'm going to translate it using different forms of the word immerse or place into. So you can hear the text actually the way Paul originally wrote it and probably intended it to be heard. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace by, may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
Do you not know that all of us who have been placed into Christ Jesus were placed into his death? We are buried therefore with him by being placed into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. To go down into water is a representation, is a symbol, is a vivid pre-technology picture of what has already happened. Don't you know that is, if you were placed into Christ, you have been placed into his death, that you have been raised with him, and what we do in this, placing into water, is to graphically and vividly portray what happened to you. To remind not only the person who being baptized, but to remind all of us we are placed into his death, we are raised up out of, the, out of the dead, and we are now to walk in newness of life. I'm so far off my manuscript. <laughs> this imagery represents union in death and union in resurrection. It's meant to invoke the death and resurrection of Christ. The imagery represents going down into the grave and the coming up from the grave. It is a burial and it is a rising to life. And the imagery represents what has already happened to us. It is a physical portrayal of an already accomplished spiritual event. So our union with Christ means that we have died to the old and are alive in the new. We have passed from spiritual death into spiritual life. Therefore we are to walk with a new kind of life in the spirit once we, since we have become a new kind of person by the Spirit. I want to find out more about that and come um, next few Sunday nights as we're expositing through Romans 6, 7, and 8, which is explaining this in, in great detail. So then, who should be baptized? Uh, just briefly, we are to baptize those who believe. And all that we have seen so far, the overwhelming biblical language and the specific command in the Great Commission, is to baptize those who believe. Therefore, I think it's natural that we would conclude we don't baptize unbelievers. And this includes infants. Baptism is not the fulfillment of circumcision. Circumcision is fulfilled in the work of the Spirit, applying the cross to your inner persons and circumcising our inner man. There is no recorded instance in the New Testament of an infant being baptized. It doesn't happen. Household baptism is of a household of believers. Now I want to take the time to pause here and I want you to turn to, to Acts chapter 16. Because those, those who want to argue for infant baptism do so because they make a direct connection to circumcision. I do not have time this morning to... to um, to disavow, I mean I can disavow it, but I can't argue against it in that sense. But then they will say, but of course we see that a person believes and his whole household is baptized. And so they take us to Acts 16. I usually beat them to the punch and say, hey, you know, let's turn to Acts 16 starting in verse 25 and let's have a, let's have a conversation about this text. About midnight in Paul. By the way, this is Church of Philippi. So they're in Philippi. They've been arrested for preaching the gospel. And uh, they're put in prison. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They hadn't contacted their lawyers. They hadn't contracted ADL. I mean, you know. They were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them, which is the reason they were singing and praying and singing hymns to God. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, and so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open, not much of a prison, but anyway, immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because if he doesn't kill himself, his, his boss is going to. Supposing the prisoners had escaped, but Paul cried with a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, we are all here. 
And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they were praying and singing hymns, right? Their hymns were good enough for people to hear the gospel, right? That's another subject for another day. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them in the same hour and night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. So see, he believes everybody's baptized, right? Keep reading. But not in your ESV. And they spoke, uh, and he took them to the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. And then he brought them to his house and set food before them. And here's where we get a mistranslation, a misplacement of a phrase. I'm going to read it as it should be. And he rejoiced that he had believed in God along with his entire household. You see how the ESV has placed that phrase so it sounds like his whole household is rejoicing. Wrong. Every other English translation, reliable, accurate translation, places the phrase and connects it to, as it should, that he had believed God along with his household. His household had believed. That is why his household was baptized. Right? In LT, he brought them into his house and set a meat before them, and he and his entire household rejoices because they had all believed in God. There you go. New American Standard. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed in God with his whole household. And so translates the German, the French, Spanish, which are the only ones I can read. I didn't think it was profitable to quote those to you. A couple of Spanish speakers in the room. And so we would say, we will baptize those by immersion who are able to confess that they have believed and bowed. We don't set age limits. We're careful with children. We don't baptize infants. And if you were baptized as an infant, I encourage you, if you have believed and bowed, that you might reconsider and not take that as your biblical baptism. Because in our view, and I think according to the scriptures, it is not. So how, do, how should we think about this? Well, first, believe the gospel. Start there. The good news of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ saves you from your sins and can save you from sinning. To acknowledge him as Lord of your life. Keep on believing the gospel. May the good news of Jesus' brutal cross kind of death and real bodily resurrection cause you to rest and trust solely in Jesus to save you from sin in this life and from judgment to come. And brothers and sisters, as believers, as you watch this and rejoice in this, reflect on the gospel. Think about what it means. Think about what it means to have passed from death to life, to have been buried with Christ, to be, have been raised with Him. As you watch this, our hearts rejoice to see a believer doing so, a person doing so. But then there, it's an object lesson. Don't lose that aspect of it. And rejoice together in the work God is doing in the lives of people. And pray for one another that the gospel we hear and the gospel we see in this will continue to transform our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you for Jesus and his death and resurrection. And thank you for the simplicity of these two ordinances that we, that we are baptized and just go through the water just to show that we have believed and then that we take a cup and that we take bread and we share it together as a symbol of participating in your death and resurrection and in fellowship together.
Thank you for that simplicity. It can be done by anyone. It can be done anywhere. And Father, I pray this morning as someone maybe has heard this and realized maybe they've never trusted you, they've never believed, they've never bowed, please grant them your saving grace, the regenerating work of the Spirit, the gifts of faith and repentance. They might have that awakening, regenerating, new birth moment even this morning. And for all of us, as we observe this and listen to this and see this and rejoice in this, may our hearts be strengthened by the grace that flows through what we will do this morning. For the glory of Jesus, we ask. Amen. It is always a great joy to baptize someone, to bring them before you and as they publicly profess faith in Christ, to acknowledge what Christ has done in their lives. And um, this morning, it is our privilege to baptize Sherry Philbrun. Sherry, if you'll come, it'll be fine down here. Thanks, Michael. This is Sherry. Hello, my name is Sherry Philburn. I grew up in a non-Christian home. We attended a Catholic church occasionally. I have believed in Jesus, but did not have a personal relationship with him. In 2015, my husband of 17 years suddenly passed away, leaving me and my two teenage sons. Life went on as best as it could. About three years later, my sons went off to college, leaving me sad, depressed, and feeling hopeless. My sister, seeing that, suggested I go with her to women's Bible study here at the chapel Chapel on suffering. As the weeks went on, I learned that even though I was suffering, one man suffered more, and he did it for me, Jesus Christ. I felt hope. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you the riches of his glory, inheritance in his holy people. I started attending Sunday morning service. I wanted to read the Bible, praying, and attending women's Bible study and flock, trying to learn more. I have accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and I'm here today to be baptized. Jerry. Upon your public profession of faith in him and your testimony, it is my great joy to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, buried with him in the likeness of his death, raised with him in the likeness of his resurrection. All of us, I'll say it again, remember, this is what happened to you when you knew Christ. Buried with him, raised with him, to walk in newness of life. That is what this is all about. Can you say amen that all my hope is in Jesus? If you can't. Today is the day. We saw and heard that Christ, through his death and resurrection, has secured our salvation. Will you embrace that hope? There are people.